Trudy Hughes. Good morning to everyone. I am the Director of Government Affairs for the California League of Food Producers. Uh, welcome to our first in a series of webinars uh, that CLFP will be holding uh, through the end of the year. Uh, we have another one coming up uh, on October the 14th. Uh, it's a, a 2020 election update, another one on October the 29th uh, that is going to be dealing with CV salt, the water quality issue that we've been working uh, very hard on for the last uh, decade or so. Um, in November 10th, we'll be uh, doing a labor law uh, update. Um, so stay tuned for those. Um, you'll probably all be receiving um, information about how to register for those moving forward. But with regard to today, uh, we are very pleased to be partnering today with the Safe Food Alliance on a, a regulatory update on food safety, which uh, based on the number of uh, uh, participants uh, that registered, uh, it seems to be a very hot topic. Uh, but before uh, we get started, I wanted to give those of you that aren't as familiar with CLFP, um, give you a little background about what we're all about um, and uh, some information kind of uh, about how you might be uh, might be interested in becoming a member. Um, CLFP is a nonprofit trade association that was established in 1905 and we're uh, an advocacy organization largely um, for food processing in California. Uh, we re represent the interests of both large and small food processors and beverage manufacturers throughout the state. Um, we're located in Sacramento and we advocate uh, both at the state capitol um, for legislation as well as the regulatory agencies um, on a number of different issues. And our main areas of advocacy uh, include food safety, of course, um, nutrition issues, uh, labeling issues, uh, environmental concerns as it relate to air, uh, water, both supply and water quality, uh, solid waste uh, issues, particularly as they um, relate to recycling. Um, we're also involved with labor and worker safety issues. Um, and energy policy. So uh, we have our plates full um, on a lot of different issues. And uh, please visit our website at www.clfp.com uh, for more information about what we do and how you can become more involved. And if you're interested in being a member, we would love to, uh, to have you. So now let's turn our attention to our presentation today. Um, again, CLFP is, is proud to partner with the Safe Food Alliance or SFA. And they are a recognized leader in food safety, uh, training, uh, laboratory services, and safe uh, food certifications. Um, and we have with us today Jeremiah Zabo, um, who is the Vice President of Professional Services at SFA, and he will be giving us a presentation on food safety regulations. But before uh, I mute myself and go off the screen, I just want to give you just a few housekeeping issues um, to keep in mind. Number one, um, you're all muted. Um, and if you are interested in chatting or asking questions of Jeremiah or have any sort of technical issues, um, you can use at the bottom of your screen uh, the chat feature or the Q&A feature. And I'll uh, let Jeremiah kind of uh, walk through how he wants to interact with you uh, moving forward with regard to questions and those sorts of things. So with that, um, I hand it over to Jeremiah and say thank you very much for your time today, all of you. And Jeremiah, thank you for being here. Um, great. So good morning, everybody. Uh, as Trudy said, uh, glad to be here with all of you this morning and um, glad we had such a great uh, turnout for today's presentation, today's webinar. As Trudy said, my name is Jeremiah Zabo. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Professional Services for Safe Food Alliance. Just real briefly, um, just to, to touch more on our organization, um, on top of what Trudy has explained already. So um, Safe Food Alliance is a subsidiary food safety technical service provider. Um, we're part of a, a parent company has actually provided um, services to specialty crops um, through a trade associations uh, for now over 100 years here in the state of California. So we're, we're very pleased to be able to offer these services to our constituents, to our members, um, also to CLFP's uh, members and uh, to all of you this morning. So um, our organization under Safe Food Alliance, just to, to briefly explain before we get into the presentation, we have basically three, three main types of services we offer industry. Um, and first is laboratory services. So we have two public uh, ISO accredited laboratories and we'll be getting into a little bit about the, the laboratory rule that um, FISMA has um, already um, published a draft on here uh, shortly. But, um, and then we also have um, uh, training 
uh, branch and department as well as a consulting branch and department under Safe Food Alliance. And then as Trudy mentioned, we do have a SIST organization called Safe Food Certifications who conducts all of our certification audits, uh, separately managed organization, but that organization offers HACCP verification audits, FISMA audits, GMP audits, um, and then on the Global Food Safety Initiative um, uh, certification audits, uh, they actually offer uh, BRC, so British Retail Global Standards, as well as Safe Quality Food or SQF uh, certified audits. So that's just a little bit um, to begin here about our organization and what we're all about. So with that being said, um, once again, welcome for those of you that are just joining. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into our presentation here. Um, that we're calling food safety regulatory updates. Uh, it's amazing, Trudy and I were just uh, talking earlier about it's already September 30th. Um, I'm sure plenty of you are dealing with uh, harvest, are dealing with uh, preparing maybe for, for the holidays in terms of packing and processing and so forth. So I know it's a busy time of the year and um, you know, it's, it's always difficult. Um, I'm sure many of you, uh, I, I know I include myself in the group, it's always difficult to find the time to stay up to speed on uh, regulations. Um, and there's regulations all across the board, right? Our organization obviously tries to stay focused on food safety re uh, related uh, regulations, what the latest is there. I know the, the league there, CLFP, also does a great job on many different regulations beyond food safety. but. Um, we're happy today and I'm happy um, to be on board with, with you and partner with them to at least give you some updates as um, we're all aware of here at our organization on what the latest and greatest is uh, regarding food safety regulations. So with that being said, um, just briefly on our agenda for today. So I want to cover the status of our um, federal as well as a little bit about our state in terms of their regulatory enforcement activities where they're currently at. Um, things are obviously quite a bit different than they intended uh, given the disruption of COVID um, in between at least this uh, 2020 uh, regulatory cycle. And then I do want to uh, focus on a couple of the, um, or I should, should say a few of the FISMA rules uh, versus others that have kind of um, their compliance has come and gone and we're now in full enforcement mode. Um, but I want to give some current status updates on a, on a few of those rules. Um, and then um, thirdly, I want to talk about, um, so FDA has been busy and they have um, been looking at really what the future of food safety looks like from a regulatory perspective. So we've come so far with the Food Safety Modernization Act and the regulations that FDA has published thus far, and they're continuing to add that. Um, so like I said, I know it's a, it's a diff difficult proposition to stay up to, uh, up to date on all these regulations. So we're gonna try to do our best uh, here over the course of about 45 uh, minutes or so to give you some brief updates. And then lastly, I wanna allow enough time um, towards the end of the session um, to allow each one of you to, um, to ask some questions. As we go through the presentations, you may have some questions on a, on a few of the topics. So I wanna allow enough time. And by all means, um, I don't think we have a hard cutoff point in terms of 11.30, we have to be done. But um, I know some of you, uh, we wanna be respectful of your time too uh, in your busy schedule. So, um, with that being said, you're more than welcome. I'll stick around a little bit longer uh, for any additional questions, but um, you're more than welcome to also reach out to us at any time. And I'll, I'll give a slide at the end that kind of has some information about how to, how to do that and where to find us. So with that said, I'll jump right into the presentation. So um, in terms of regulatory activity, right, enforcement and where we're currently at, um, there isn't unfortunately a lot of um, dramatic type updates to share with all of you. Um, as many of you know, uh, with the FISMA rules, FDA has been very focused on utilizing the resources they have 
right? And it's an enormous task to regulate uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act regulations, of course, as many of you know, but they have been basing their inspection enforcement activity, right, um, using risk, right? So that's um, risk on imported foods, that's risk on domestic food production as well. Um, so they're gonna continue to do that as, as time moves on. Now in this uh, uh, COVID realm now, um, and until things really, um, you know, kind of, um, start to die off, uh, I guess, literally and figuratively on the COVID situation, the virus, um, you know, they, they had an initial pause in enforcement. They're still doing some enforcement currently. However, that's looking a lot different than it was with some of their, their plans uh, they had at the beginning of the year. Um, so some of the exceptions to the on-site visits uh, currently have been what they deem as mission critical inspections. Um, and those are both domestically and internationally. Uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, here about how they're going about doing those. Um, so currently some of the FISMA uh, inspections are limited uh, in their nature. Um, by and large, for the most part, they're going to be pre-announced. Um, there are some mission critical inspections, obviously, that they're undertaking as as those um, outbreaks or those investigation uh, opportunities come up. Um, obviously, they are obligated to protect the public health. Um, so some limitations based on risk, they're pre-announcing their, their regulatory visits if they are doing any at all. Um, on the produce safety rule, so inspections are proceeding there. Um, there are some limitations based on the timing of crop I'll explain a little bit more here in the next upcoming slides on how that's working currently in our state uh, with our state health department. And then, um, as I mentioned uh, just a mi minute ago, in terms of limited inspections, so they are undertaking some virtual remote inspections. Um, so kind of a new realm. I know some of the um, non-regulatory audits, customer audits, and even some of the audits we've been doing under our certification body. Um, we've, it's, it's definitely been a learning process with um, requirements, with the ins and outs of virtual remote inspections. And I think it's no different with our um, federal uh, FDA agency and state agencies in terms of how they're going about um, during this COVID time. So just some of our staff and our internal organization and industry observations we've had during this COVID uh, downtime. Um, and, and, and by all means, just to reiterate, if you do have um, questions, go ahead and you can enter those into the chat feature and we'll try to address those once again at the end of the presentation. Um, so observations during COVID downtime, um, we have seen that FDA has been busy sending their inspectors to uh, training. Uh, we've actually had some in our training courses. We've done quite a bit of produce safety training um, for the state of California and for growers. Um, um, I'm getting some feedback that the presentation's a little blurry, um, low definition. Um, in some cases, that could be on either, hopefully it's not on my end, but it could be also on your end. I know sometimes uh, broadband issues um, happen. If it continues to happen, go ahead and let me know. Um, it's always a learning, learning process with these webinars. Um, can't read it at all. So let me do this. I'm going to try to um, stop share and then reshare my presentation. So give me just a minute. And if it continues to happen on anybody's end, um, you may have to log in and log out as well yourself. So I'm gonna see if, um, if I can do this real quick. I'm gonna stop share, and then I'm gonna reshare my screen here. And see if this is better for anybody based on the comments coming in. Jeremiah, that, that is this Trudy. This is it's much better. Okay. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's a learning process. And I know some of these platforms, um, sometimes uh, I've already had that experience in the past. So uh, sometimes that does the trick. So, well, great. Um, 
So with that being said, to get back here, um, so we have seen FDA looking to send their um, inspectors to training and type, try to take advantage of, of the so-called COVID downtime. Um, the other thing that the agency is doing as well is they're calling to confirm and update facility registration information, if any. And I should point out to all of you, if you're not already aware, um, keep, keep in mind there is that biennial uh, FDA facility registration requirement um, going back to the Bioterrorism Act registration in 2002. Um, so that is a biennial requirement and this year is an even year. So you will need to re-register your facility by the end of this year. So something you may just want to make note of if you're not um, already aware of that. Okay, looks like the presentation's coming coming through good. Thanks for the, thanks for the comments. Um, the other thing that has happened in just going back and reviewing some of the assessments and the inspections that have happened here in this year, 2020, like I said, I, I think from a federal regulatory enforcement perspective, obviously it, it's kind of been a letdown in terms of from FDA's perspective of being out there to do routine inspections and assessments um, due to COVID and this downtime period. Um, so really with the foreign supplier verification rule, which I'll touch on here briefly going forward, um, just to make um, everybody aware of where we we're currently at on that. Um, but there have been 35 warning letters issued to importers. Now keep in mind, um, these aren't necessarily issued to the foreign suppliers. These are issued to the supply, um, to the importers, excuse me, um, that are working with those foreign suppliers. Um, and then the other, other thing to note on these foreign supplier verification program requirements, um, inspections, this is one of those areas where inspections are actually being done remotely and virtually um, to confirm compliance details. Now this is kind of new, well, this is new territory, not kind of, it is new territory for FDA in that there are no provisions in our regulations for them to conduct remote um, or virtual audits. So this is this is kind of a learning process and we'll get into and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up this presentation with this new era in food safety um, um, uh, guidance that FDA has released um, and blueprint as they call it that will actually be addressing some of what's happening here um, in, in real time and going forward. Under the preventive controls for human food rule which also includes your current good manufacturing practices, of course. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, FDA had planned to do about 800 of those inspections domestically. Um, obviously, they're not going to be anywhere near that this year due to the COVID downtime. Um, there, there have been 53 warning letters issued um, year to date by the agency. Uh, mainly, these are due to follow-up um, compliance and citation issues uh, prior to, to COVID or pre-COVID and those visits and inspections happening then. Um, so it could be from late 2019 into early um, pre-COVID in, in 2020. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, those warning letters and those follow-up uh, follow-ups and so forth are also due to um, their activities regarding recalls and any outbreak investigations that have been ongoing. So um, that's kind of the latest in terms of enforcement at the federal side. Um, I have been in contact with a few of our clients that have actually mentioned to me that they have had some state inspector visits um, on behalf of the uh, health department as well, the state health department as well as um, in the pretense of covering FSMA requirements. Um, some of those seem to be slightly modified in their visits um, and those that I've heard have just taken place here in about the last month. So um, keep in mind that those visits right now, uh, to my knowledge, are announced. Um, so they will contact the facility and some of you may have been um, the, the uh, lucky recipients of, of some of those visits as, as well. Um, so. This is in the state of California right now um, that we're talking about in terms of state health departments. 
But of course, with FISMA and FDA's looking at those partnerships too, which we'll talk about here as we get into the um, some of the new era in food safety material towards the the conclusion of the presentation. Um, so this is the current federal uh, enforcement information that's available right now. Um, of course, they'll continue to add to that. And I really don't see a lot of additional activity happening in enforcement until, um, by and large, I would think until um, we really start to make progress on a vaccine and you know, facilities start to open up more in terms of visitors um, because we, we've even seen that um, from our organization's perspective in terms of going out to do uh, uh, member uh, client audits and visits and so forth. Um, as facilities should be, they are controlling those pretty tightly um, to prevent any future spread of COVID. So, um, so only time will tell on that. Um, we're kind of in this, this waiting period to, to learn more about enforcement activities and what those may look like. So for now, uh, FDA is kind of keeping those focused uh, in on their critical or mission critical uh, activities as they call them. So I want to give a brief update just on the produce safety rule here in the state of California. As I mentioned before, our organization is uh, one of the organization that has lead instructors under this rule um, that um, we're able to, to deliver the standardized tra training for growers. Now, some of you I realize on the call may um, not have growers that um, have to be compliant with this, with this rule. Um, some of you, I, I did recognize some of the names on the call that we work with um, in certain industries will have farms and growers that are affected and will be um, regulated under this rule. So I just wanted to um, make sure to mention um, at least the updated information we have on the produce safety program requirements and how regulatory enforcement is working here in the state of California. So right now it is enforcement is done under a new department that is um, a department under the California Department of Food and Ag called the Produce Safety Program. Of course, um, on the federal side, because this is a federal uh, Food Safety Modernization Act rural requirement, um, FDA has oversight and they do have those cooperative agreements with certain states um, ac across the nation. And keep in mind that this rule is even going to impact, uh, be impactful for foreign providers as well and foreign farms if they are providing uh, produce into the United States and ingredients. Now, in the state of California, it's estimated, CDFA estimates that there's about 22,000 farms that are uh, will be impacted and will be required to be uh, compliant with this produce safety rule. And as of May of this year, at least in the knowledge that we have, uh, CDFA is still working, this program is still working to update their list of farms. As you can imagine, there's probably a lot of ins and outs and things change rather rapidly. Um, even at the farm setting, there may be different crops that are grown from year to year that may fall under the regulatory um, compliance elements under this rule. Um, but in terms of their inspections, so their inspections have begun as of last year. Um, their intent uh, under the produce safety program with the state is to um, educate as they regulate. They've said that many of times. Um, they started off with having these uh, uh, readiness assessments available for farms in our state. Um, but uh, as of May, up through the end of May, um, in their reviews thus far uh, from, and I think this is good news for ag communities in, in California overall and the farm, farm communities that uh, are growing produce that fall under these requ requirements is so far the inspectors have not found any egregious concerns as they say, or any uh, you know, kind of critical elements during their inspections. Um, 25% of the farms, uh, going back to, hey, a, a good message for California farms and growers, have had no correction, corrective um, actions needed. Um, and most of the concerns are, uh, that are raised by the inspectors are addressed by the growers or the farms on the same day. So that just tells me that most of the findings are pretty minor in nature. Um, a lot of them will be regarding 
documentation, record keeping, of course, and that's kind of been the biggest learning curve um, with the grower communities, uh, at least that I've noticed an organization has noticed in conducting the training and with some of the consulting for those clients. Um, so as I mentioned, some of those issues could be um, corrected right on the spot during those inspections. Um, but this is kind of a short list of some of the areas of concern. So the produce safety rule for growers requires uh, seven or eight main elements. Um, and, and most of them are up here on the screen, but a lot of them have to do with record keeping, of course, right? Um, so informing visitors as to the do's and don'ts. So those could be even contracted services that the farms are bringing on, on site or hiring out. Uh, records there again for biological soil amendment applications, animal intrusion risks, and the assessments of those, um, which also has overlap into the areas of corrective actions um, for any of the regulatory uh, requirements or any of the hazard risk assessments on the farm. Cleaning and sanitation, of course, um, a new element in certain areas for, um, for farmers, for growers, and then employee health and hygiene training programs. So we, you know, farms have had a lot of this in place for OSHA requirements and safety requirements. Now they're gonna uh, be under a requirement to add the food safety, health and hygiene training requirements. And then obviously with the COVID situation that throws a whole nother wrinkle into health and hygiene uh, training requirements that really has overlap with some of the food safety training elements as well. Okay, so that's kind of a brief update. Like I said, um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time here and we just have a short time to uh, kind of go through what the latest and greatest is here regarding uh, regulatory enforcement um, and how that's happening on the on the national level and in some cases on the international level as well as here in the state of California. Um, so I want to get into um, a, a bit of some updates on FISMA. Okay, so as many of you know, uh, FISMA was, was first signed into law um, back in early 2011, January 2011, I believe it was. Um, so it, it's amazing where, where time goes, it just flies as the saying goes. So as of this January 2021 coming up, it'll be 10 years since the introduction of FISMA. Obviously our, our federal um, agency, Food and Drug Administration has been busy since. Um, some of the seven main rules that are shown here on the screen were some of the first rules that they went to work and, and had released and published to the public in terms of where they wanted to focus their efforts um, in, in terms of new regulations or modernized regulations as um, was, was stated with the name of the rule or the, the law. So as you can see here, we've already um, the compliance has kind of already come and gone for many of these rules. Um, there's a few here that are still pending and are still in flux in terms of being fully under uh, regulatory enforcement. But the first one there, or the first two have to do with the preventive controls. In other words, it may be called the HARPSI or Hazard Analysis Risk-Based Preventive Controls Rule. And those were both for food and animal food, uh, feed. I think the animal feed got a, a year or two year longer extension on their compliance than the, the human food. But those um, compliance states have come and gone now. So pretty much all the provisions of those rules are in full effect. As I was mentioning here, just with the produce safety rule requirements. So the last farms, um, the smallest of the farms down to $25,000 in, in produce sales per year on an annualized basis actually had to be compliant with that rule as of this past January. Um, so that um, compliance, I should say, started in 2018. Um, and then it had three years after um, up to the smallest farms for full compliance. There's still some provisions of the rules that are still to come on water testing for those growers. That part of the rule has actually been extended four years. Um, from the publication, which will actually be starting for the largest farms in, in 2022. So January of 2022. And then that goes out to January 2024 for the smallest farms. Now I'll talk more about foreign supplier verification. 
uh, program, accreditation of the third party auditors, which are linked together with that program. Um, and then the intentional adulteration rule, I just wanna give some updates on that um, as well. So we'll have some further slides here, here shortly to look at on those and to review with you. Under the sanitary transportation of food and feed, so like I mentioned, the, the compliance dates have um, come and gone on those. I think I believe those go back to about 2017 into 2018 on that rule. Um, so I'm not going to uh, spend much time touching on some of those where the compliance dates have already come and gone. Um, but by all means, if you have questions on those um, as we get into the um, as we get into the um, materials here and the end of the presentation, by all means, uh, feel free to um, chime in when that time comes. Okay, so the first rule I want to cover um, with you today under FISMA and kind of give an update on where we're at because this one's still, the compliance dates are here, but they're still um, continuing for some of the smaller processors. Um, so that's called the FISMA intentional adulteration rule um, in short. So with this rule, keep in mind, some folks may refer to it as kind of the food, food defense rule or biosecurity rule, right? So the intent here is for facilities that manufacture, process, pack, or hold human food, which is basically the definition under, um, you know, section 415, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So any facility that is required to register with the FDA will have to be compliant with this rule, and we'll get into some compliance states here shortly. Um, for now, this rule does not uh, apply to the farm level or raw commodity, um, raw agricultural commodity level, or the retail food level, okay? We'll talk about um, going forward, there is some mention of uh, new technology and new requirements um, that are mentioned in the blueprint for this new era of food safety, where there's obviously going to be overlap and references back to some of these rules. Um, so going forward, uh, obviously there may be some things that that change or where we get further guidance as to how FDA is going to apply these rules and how they expect their partners at the state and local levels to um, kind of come alongside of them and mutually apply these rules going forward. Okay, so this rule, just like the preventive controls rule for processors and providers of food here in the United States, they, it does apply to domestic operations as well as imported food. So for importers, they will have some verification requirements for those facilities that they are purchasing food from or importing food from uh, into the United States. Um, there are some exemptions and modified requirements, which I believe the, the next slide will kind of show um, the compliance dates and how that works. Um, there is a minimum threshold for full compliance here for food processors. That's that first top bullet point here, which is very small businesses. So those are businesses that average uh, food sales of, and, and it's not only food sales, it's food storage and ingredient storage, keep that in mind, um, that will have five years um, from the publication of the rule. Um, to be compliant, although there will be modified requirements if you're less than a $10 million per year um, sales and value of product stored. Um, so those folks that fall under that category between the 500 full-time equivalent employees uh, um, and the $10 million in food sales per year and food storage value will actually have up till January of next year. That'll be the fin final compliance date for this rule um, for those businesses that were um, um, 500 full-time equivalent, but um, you know, not less than 10 million. Actually, your compliance state has just recently come and gone. Um, and then for all other larger businesses, uh, they had three years to comply, which that compliance state has already come and gone as of uh, July, uh, middle of the year, 2019. Now keep in mind for regulatory and compliance here and enforcement, FDA had planned to begin routine inspections to the intentional alteration rule this past spring. I believe they um, had mentioned or had released information about March of 2020 being the 
um, first time they would start um, enforcement and compliance enforcement inspections, routine inspections of this rule and encapsulate that along with their other FISMA, preventive controls inspections, et cetera. Um, obviously that's been delayed due to COVID. Um, with some of these recent inspections that I'm aware of at the state level, uh, some of the, the processors I have talked with when they have uh, received an inspection have actually had some elements of the intentional adulteration starting to be asked about um, in terms of program requirements, record review, and so forth. Um, so I'll talk about that here briefly in terms of what some of the at least high level ins and outs are of this rule. So all of you are aware of um, and can prepare for um, these pending uh, routine inspections that are forthcoming. So the very small bit, um, businesses, um, obviously, um, excuse me, the, the small businesses and then going on a year beyond to the very small businesses. So um, for the small businesses, if that is applicable to you, and I would imagine um, there's a number of you on the call that fall under this small business category. So keep in mind that enforcement of routine inspections for the intentional adulteration rule will begin in um, March, at least the plan is for them to begin in March of 2021. So bottom, bottom line on this is really um, due to COVID, things have been delayed in terms of beginning the routine inspections, okay? So just a, a few slides briefly to touch on this rule. Um, so this rule, the intentional adulteration rule, really establishes requirements to prevent or significantly minimize um, acts or events, right, of intended to cause harm, wide-scale hazardous situations with the food supply chain, right? Um, so things like sabotage, in, uh, internal um, uh, disgruntled employee involvement, um, uh, lacks of security at the site, those type of things. And it really spans beyond just a food, food defense program, which I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with. And it really pushes facilities to um, show compliance and document compliance using a HACCP, um, a hazard analysis critical control point type methodology or approach. Um, some of you may have already heard these terms, but um, you know, these are terms going around the industry, not necessarily with the rule directly um, from FDA's perspective, but the intent is there. So um, you hear these terms such as VASIP or TASIP, so uh, vulnerability um, analysis or assessment and critical control points uh, with those vulnerabilities to mainly food fraud, those type of situations when it comes to food safety hazards in ingredients and in the product formulations themselves. And then TASSUP being threat assessment critical control points. And this is more talking about the acts of, of intended harm um, to the food supply chain, okay? So really um, it's gonna require facilities to take that type of a, uh, an approach. It has to be um, based on risk and it can be flexible, right? Every facility is different in terms of the ingredients, their supply chain, length of that supply chain, as well as their process and flow of their process on their site and in their facility. So FDA recognizes that. And because of that, really they're putting the onus on each of you to demonstrate that, hey, we have properly assessed all of the um, both threats and the vulnerabilities to our ingredients and our food supply chain, um, both, both upstream and then downstream. Um, just to further uh, reiterate and give some further details. So it's really, uh, about the rule, excuse me, it's really about food defense plan plus, I would call it. Um, so it does require a uh, vulnerability assessment. Um, and this assessment has to be for key activity types in the facility. Uh, we'll touch briefly on, on what that means here in the next slide. Um, and then as a result of that assessment, it requires mitigation strategies put, be put into place, right? and not only put into place um, as they may have been with your traditional food defense plans um, where, hey, maybe we do an assessment or a review once a year of our, our security, you know, our, our, our security cameras, is our, our check-in, check-out system working, the doors locked, everything's secured. 
but it really goes beyond that in terms of establishing um, um, more frequent verification activities and corrective actions for any uh, incidents or issues that are found with the site um, regarding those mitigation strategies. Um, and then one other thing that is unique with the rule is it does require some awareness about the intentional adulteration rule and about both biosecurity, food defense activities for supervisors and managers, as well as your staff in general. So all staff has to be aware of the, the um, um, food defense protocols that the site has put into place, security uh, um, protocols, how to identify threats and so forth. Um, and then the supervisor managers, usually this is referring to those um, um, who would be part of the food defense team traditionally um, in terms of where they want some uh, knowledge, right, on the intentional adulteration rule. Um, so the other thing is there is not, unlike the, the produce safety rule and the preventive controls rule, with this rule there is not a formal training that is absolutely required. It's more generally stated in terms of awareness of the rule requirements, how to go about um, um, putting in place those uh, assessment activities and mitigation steps. So talking about the assessment here, um, like we said, it both has to be a vulnerability assessment as well as a threat assessment. Uh, we want to identify it requires that a process flow diagram be mapped out just like you do for HASA, but identify the actionable process steps where um, uh, contamination can happen um, from an external source or even an internal source, right? Think about employees wanting to do harm to general public um, and your consumers, your customers. So the, the plan and the rule really wants you to identify in your plans those potential um, impact points, right? A lot of these are gonna be where products being mixed, where ingredients are being added, where there's exposure of open products, right? And then obviously in the receiving and shipping process as well, depending on the nature of your product. Um, so obviously with that being said, you need to address the degree of physical access to the product um, and the ability of the attacker to successfully contaminate that product, okay? So this really goes beyond just the food fraud elements, which are more of the vulnerability elements of the rule into the threat assessment for the site. Um, and then lastly, once you've identified those, those threats or those vulnerabilities, the rule does require you to identify mitigation strategies, measures to ensure right, that those vulnerabilities and threats have been um, at least mitigated as best as possible or to the best of your abilities on site. Obviously, we can't always uh, predict the, the unforeseen situations that may come up from time to time, but here it, it's doing your due diligence and the show as best as possible. You've done all you can do to mitigate some of those vulnerabilities and, um, and open areas, right, of, of potential, um, of where potential issues can occur. Um, and then with that being said, right, so on the implementation part, you have to show a way of how you are verifying those activities um, in order to make sure that they are consistently working, okay? And then obviously with FISMA or any type of regulation, especially food safety regulations nowadays, um, if you don't write it down, keep a record of it happening, you can't ever prove that it, it did indeed happen, right? So time, date, who the qualified individual or trained individual was that did those verification and monitoring activities will be important there. Okay, so that's the intentional adulteration rule and I'm sure some of you will have questions and we'll, we'll address those here uh, shortly at the conclusion. Um, but I wanna just briefly touch on the foreign supplier verification rule requirements. Compliance dates have come and gone for this rule, but I think it's, it's still a work in progress. Um, FDA, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, um, from their perspective, has not yet been able to go out and do enough of these foreign supplier verifications and work with the importers. So it is a work in progress. Um, as you can imagine, it entails a lot of complexity. Um, um, I forget, uh, I, uh, what the exact number was, and it may have been from a few years past, but something like 15 million individual 
shipments are imported regarding food and ingredients on any calendar year into the United States. So just talk about an enormous task, right? Um, obviously, some of those foods are going to be higher risk than others. Um, and some of those have been shown to actually have contributed to outbreaks or recalls in the past. So FDA obviously is going to be focused on enforcement around those um, ingredients and products. But with this one, it really goes beyond um, just talking about having your documented supplier approval process in place, uh, making sure there's proper traceability of what you're purchasing from those approved suppliers, written procedures for verification activities. The verification activities have to be done by qualified and trained individuals. So there is specific training, um, just like there is under the Preventive Controls for Human Food Rule, um, the two and a half day training um, under the foreign supplier verification program rule. So um, for if you have uh, or in, are involved, excuse me, in the foreign supplier verification rule as an importer on record registered with FDA, or if you work with organizations that do, if they've gone to the PCQI training and they've um, completed that, that does uh, cover the rule requirements here under the foreign supplier verification activities that need to be done by a qualified individual. But nevertheless, um, this is still going to refer back to food safety plans. And as FDA has started to conduct routine enforcement um, inspections and assessments on importers, the, by far the number one um, lacking element that they found is that there haven't been documented um, HACCP-like risk assessment, right? We're going back to the FISMA terminology of the hazard analysis risk-based preventive control assessment for importers, right? So um, along with some of the record keeping elements, um, although most of the time it's um, gonna be the plan that has not yet been written and implemented and reviewed effectively by their food safety teams um, for the importers on record. Um, you know, FDA stated the reasons for the rule, obviously uh, with those 15 million plus shipments in a year, right? They're looking at um, making sure there's adequate assurances uh, on the foreign suppliers themselves because part of FISMA requires that those providers of food and ingredients into the United States also be compliant with the FISMA regulations. Obviously, they're concerned about um, adulteration and misbranding, misbranding, as well as labeling requirements for, especially where food is packed um, at, in terms of a consumer or in consumer customer um, standpoint outside of the country, but is then distributed in our country. Um, and then obviously they want to make sure that the same level of public health protection um, is applied not only to domestic food, but also it, um, equally to the imported foods. Now, there is this accredited third party certification program rule that has overlap and has uh, emphasis back to the foreign supplier rule. So this is now in effect. Um, so FDA has already started approving uh, accreditation bodies to then approve certification bodies to conduct your audits like your BRC, SQF, FSSC audits, and actually FISMA style audits outside of the United States on foreign suppliers and manufacturers. So that is something that is happening. Um, the first accreditation body was is now uh, been approved or has been approved for a couple of years. Um, so that will continue to happen provide enough access um, to certifying bodies on the international front for those suppliers into the United States. And keep in mind with any of the rules, but in particular with the supply chain for the foreign supplier rule, if it is applicable to you, there are options in terms of FDA's expect, uh, expectations of you in identifying, but also controlling hazards, right? So this little diagram just kind of shows an example of you know, it could be any type of food if you've identified a particular hazard such as salmonella. Well, you do have uh, options in how you're going to demonstrate that's controlled. And obviously that has to be shown in your programs, documented, and then records need to be kept as a result, right? So whether that means um, verification records for uh, hazards that are controlled by your suppliers, right? So if for 
say it was a baked good or an ingredient, et cetera, whatever the case may be, if they're trying to control salmonella through pasteurization or treatment there, uh, uh, thermal treatment and beyond, then um, you're, you're gonna be responsible for verifying their programs, right? Or the importer on record would be. Um, and there's a variety of ways within the rule in which you can do that. It also has an overlap back to your supply chain program requirements under the preventive controls rule for human food. Um, you can also choose to control that hazard yourself. So if that's the case, then that directly applies back to the preventive controls rule. Um, as well as in some cases, you may recognize that, hey, the hazards still exist even after my process. So therefore, I'm going to have to give some sort of written assurance to my customer as well as receive some written assurance back from them in terms of how they're going to deal with that hazard. So really as the saying has gone as uh, in terms of when FISMA was released, FDA doesn't really who care who controls the hazard, they just wanna make sure it's controlled in the supply chain and that all parties involved are aware of how that hazard is controlled. So this leads into making sure that if the foreign supplier verification program rules are um, applicable to you, that you are conducting a HACCP-like methodology standard of evaluating the hazards, doing a risk analysis or risk assessment of the foods and your ingredients that you're importing, um, making sure you're identifying hazards that are inherent to the food. So it could be allergens, it could be certain types of toxins um, and so forth that are just inherent to the food that you have to make sure you are aware of and you're documenting and then you know your customers downstream potentially depending on your scenario um, if you're controlling the hazards in your process making sure that's clear in terms of how that's happening the monitoring the verification and validation of those systems and then keep in mind that that assessment should be based on your supplier risk, as well as the um, history of adulteration issues and anything like that that have happened with those ingredients over the years that we have knowledge on, okay? And for this assessment, you can have third parties conduct those assessments on your behalf, um, or you may be able to use those um, certified accreditation um, uh, bodies that have have accredited the certifying bodies overseas to conduct the audits in terms of your verification activities. Um, okay, so that's the foreign supplier verification rule. I know that may not directly apply to all of you, but you may be working with a number of your providers that do have to be compliant. So by default, you're gonna kind of have to verify their compliance and that's a continuing process like I mentioned earlier. Um, because we are a laboratory, a third party ISO certified laboratory, I do want to mention just briefly, I have this one slide on um, the FISMA laboratory rule. So it wasn't initially part of one of the main seven rules under FISMA, but it has been a subset of, of a rule that FDA has wanted to get to. And um, so it is one of the last rules they have been working on in terms of when they have released its publication, which is last um, November. Since then, they've, they've released multiple, um, um, you know, feedback dates in terms of for industry to comment or comment periods, I should say, as they call them. Um, and they've had to postpone those um, continuously um, due to a number of factors, the last one being due to COVID. So even though I believe the last comment period ended in June, if I'm not mistaken, um, but even if you go to their website and you look at the rule, they do mention they'll continue to take feedback um, and comments from industry on this rule. So if you do have comments, um, just keep that in mind. Uh, the rule is expected, or at least the goal of publication and finalization by FDA is, is um, now about a year and a half out from their perspective. They wanna get that done and over with in February, 2022. Um, one of the reasons maybe uh, why it's so far out, well, there's a lot of complexity when it comes to testing. As you can imagine, there's plenty of private labs spread out across the United States as well as internationally. Um, their accreditations may vary. Um, however, there is more standardization um, uh, that those labs are undertaking to come up to speed on. I know part of the rule does require um, some accreditation uh, activities. So the lab 
has to use a FDA approved um, accreditation body to be certified to the ISO 17025 standard. Um, those accreditation bodies have to be um, compliant with the International Laboratory Accreditation Agreement um, to standardize and harmonize those laboratory and food testing methodology requirements. Um, some of the more specifics here are shown on the slides. Um, so there are these mentioned food testing orders in the rule or in the draft proposal as it stands right now. Excuse me. Um, so specific tests on imported goods and those hazards of, you know, that have caused outbreaks and concerns in the past are what FDA is focused on in using, utilizing our private lab systems um, to, to help with those evaluations. If there are detention orders that FDA has seized, then obviously using these accredited labs for testing um, and submitting evidence um, on behalf of uh, the, the importer to FDA to get those detentions um, closed, as well as testing requirements for any type of outbreaks or food safety episodes and compliance and enforcement issues that FDA is working on. Um, and then the rule right now with any of these scenarios does require uh, labs to send results directly to the FDA. Okay, so moving on, um, I do want to give an update here and I'll end with this category, so to say, or with this, this subject, but there has been, as was announced in Jan uh, July of this year, so a couple months ago, a release of this new era of smarter food safety blueprint for industry. Excuse me. So this blueprint, um, some of you may have already been aware of this or uh, may not have been, and that's all right. I want to just kind of give an update here of how things are going to kind of look in the future, as well as where FDA's headed in this kind of post uh, Food Safety Modernization Act world, right? So they're continuing to add and build upon some of the standards that um, were put into place under the Food Safety Modernization Act. So this new era of smarter food safety essentially has four core areas of focus. Uh, number one, tech enabled traceability. Two, smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response. Three, new business models and retail modernization. And then fourthly, the food safety culture elements. So I'm going to briefly touch on some of these. Obviously, there's not a lot of detail with, with this yet, but the first of its rule, uh, it, rules has already been released and is, and is here, right? So the draft rule called the FISMA traceability rule, and this is the most recent update uh, regarding food safety regulation here um, for, for facilities. This was actually just released uh, 921, I guess it was the beginning of last week. Um, or about uh, nine days ago or so. Um, it was originally due for release it back in March, but it has been delayed due to COVID. Um, and I must say with any of these, these new era blueprint um, uh, rules that they are planning on releasing, by and large, this has been uh, essentially the focus of the work of um, Frankie Honest, um, many of you know that name. He's been a big proponent on um, using, utilizing technology or leveraging technology in the supply chain. He's a big proponent of like blockchain for traceability. Obviously he comes to the FDA. Um, he was a food safety um, and quality vice president under Walmart, Sam's Club's brands. Um, and then before that he worked as a safety and health officer for um, Disney. So obviously he's bringing a lot of his um, uh, opinion in his new role as a deputy commissioner um, for FDA. So I think primarily this is why you're starting to see the, this new element of FISMA kind of being built upon, right? So a little bit here about the food safety or the food traceability rule, excuse me. Um, it is focused on certain high risk foods of which I have a, a table here I'll show with you shortly. Um, they want better linkage across supply chain to basically be able to respond to food safety outbreaks and issues quicker and really narrow down the impacts of those um, outbreaks and recall, recalls as a result. They want to leverage technology like I mentioned earlier. And then just one thing to note for all of you is the public comment period is open for 120 days at this point. 
not sure if they'll extend that anymore. Sometimes they often do, but um, you know, that takes, takes us up to just about the end of the year in terms of providing comments and feedback to FDA on the rule. Um, this may be a little bit hard for you to see. It's kind of a large table to fit into one slide here. But these are the main categories of food and food products that the traceability rule is focused on right now. Um, keep in mind that the rule does talk about that it's not only the processing of these foods, but it's also if you are using any of these foods listed as ingredients, okay? So you can see here, a lot of this has been focused first and primarily on foods that have been um, suspected or even been confirmed to be the sources of outbreaks in the past, right? So certain high risk commodity, but you know, there are some uh, broad categories too, in terms of when you get down into tropical tree fruits, fruits and vegetables. So it's gonna include multiple different commodities under some of those categories, okay? So just to share that with you, and you can find the draft guidance on the FDA's website right now. And like I said, review that. If it is applicable to you, definitely be aware of what those requirements may be. But some of the elements of that rule that we're starting to become aware of, and, and I must be honest, I haven't read the, the full rule, rule from uh, front to back, but um, I think it's about 55 pages. So in terms of FISMA rules, uh, relatively a, a shorter rule, um, especially going back to some of those original rules that were six, 700 pages long. Um, but it does ask facilities that have to be compliant to identify what they call are these key data elements at each of their steps in their process or in the supply chain. And in terms of how those would apply to each facility, um, you're, you're gonna have to think about where you basically take that traceability or those traceability uh, data elements, right? In terms of how your ingredients are coming in and how they're traced or identified and then apply those internally to your internal traceability programs. And then also when you go to ship that product. Um, so there is further guidance. They did just uh, release this critical tracking event and key data elements guidance tool here that gives some examples of how the rule will be expected, uh, how the rule will expect to be applied, okay? Um, so as you can see here, going from in some cases growing shipping and then the receiver there will be elements for the receiver to be requirement um, to be required to follow in terms of record keeping um, any transformation transformation of the product that's processing um, there will be key data elements that will be required there obviously and then shipping and receiving out to the even to the retail retail level um, in some cases so this this is an area that i thought all along that fisma um, hadn't really got to originally right in the past 10 years and and I was kind of always curious as to why they hadn't and um, I always kind of told folks that it's only a matter of time before FDA starts um, incorporating traceability requirements um, given some of the the outbreaks we've had over the years and the difficulty in tracing them back to um, their their sources right okay um, so that's the food traceability rule. Keep in mind you have until December, at least in this first comment period, to comment on that um, in, it, in, its, in its draft form as of right now. Um, the next category they have are these new business models. And, and well, talk about timely on this. Um, so with um, you know the Uber Eats and the DoorDash and that sort of thing, this is one of the areas FDA is obviously interested in in terms of the potential at that, we'll just call it a retail level and an e-commerce level, right, to, um, for outbreaks to occur and some of the risk with that whole food delivery system, especially in this COVID world now. Um, so there will be more to come on that. Um, that will be one of the categories they will be addressing going forward. Um, so they hope to address food service, delivery, e-commerce, broaden the adoption of FDA's food code um, at the retail level and at those food service levels. They will be looking to enhance and develop new training curricula for everybody involved. And um, that's not just the food service operation, but even taking it out to the pickup and delivery um, um, 
companies and employees and staff involved as well. And then they will be looking at implementing new digital tools in tracking these new business models or that these new business models may be able to take advantage of, such as apps and so forth for temperature control, for training requirements, for any records that they may need to be um, keeping as a result. So more to come on that with the new business model area. Um, and then the, the third element is this smarter tools and approaches for prevention category. Um, so here FDA is looking to, they want to utilize root cause analysis. Um, so those of you that have been doing global food safety initiative audits, you know that's a key element of that um, and has been for a number of years. And I think there again, you see some of Frankie Honest's um, um, stamp on that, right? Bringing that over from industry to the agency. Um, they want to strengthen, strengthen predictive analytics. So what they're talking about here is using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And one of the first um, uh, blueprints or, or um, beta tests that they want to do on that is regarding um, seafood operations and in particular imported seafood so that they can quickly detect any types of hazards in the food uh, supply chain regarding that industry and they want to continue to build that out for other types of commodities and food ingredients. Um, they want to continue to build upon this what they call domestic mutual reliance. So this is where they're partnering with state and local health agencies right in terms of inspections and providing further uh, collaboration with those other agencies at the local level. Um, Inspection training and compliance tools is another category under this, this section and under this pending rule that will come out. But they talk about, and it's funny that these are already happening on the foreign supplier side, right, with the agency, but they talk about remote, virtual, and maybe only focused component inspections, right? So focused on risk um, from that standpoint. When it comes to outbreak response, they want to continue to add to FDA's genome tracker, right? And add more ingredients and, and have more data to pull from um, using PulseNet for outbreaks, as well as work with those domestic mutual reliance um, agencies at the local level for rapid deployment in terms of outbreaks and really getting to the root cause and the bottom of that outbreak quickly. And then lastly, under this category, they want um, further recall modernization. So this kind of ties back to the traceability requirements and potentially the things like blockchain. Um, but right now, the, the one thing they mentioned in the blueprint is that um, they want something like a United States government app that consumers and those retailers can um, be notified of recall and potential harmful outbreaks as quickly as possible, right? And we already know some um, organizations and some companies are utilizing that with their customers. Like I, I do know like Costco has been one of the first initiators on that in, in terms of hey, if there's a recall with a product, we wanna get that out to our members and consumers as quickly as possible. And then lastly, we're almost done here, here folks. Sorry for taking a, a few minutes longer in terms of our, our start and end point here, but um, Food safety culture. So food safety culture, they do have some goals. And there again, another, um, another stamp of Frankie Honest's kind of ex, um, influence with the agency, but FDA is um, looking at strengthening as they define food safety culture. They wanna strengthen food safety culture on farms, food facilities, and at home, and that mainly focused for employees that work in the food industry. Um, so with food safety culture, some of you have probably heard of the term. Some of you have maybe uh, learned more about the term and have actually started to implement this on your, your facility sites or in your company. Um, but with culture, keep in mind, now we're gravitating away from only using traditional kind of hard science or hard food science. Um, and we're coupling that up now with behavioral science, right? Um, so it does use and focus on behavioral science principles um, in terms of change management and changing the culture of an organization. Of course, with um, culture, right, um, it's all about what does the group think, right? So those shared values, um, shared um, principles that guide the group and, 
and how do we up uh, their understanding for better food safety culture it, at each facility. So that's where FDA is going to be focused on with this rule. They've also mentioned that they want to talk about um, releasing some social marketing plans or um, building awareness uh, with not only with consumers at home, but also with employees in particular working at food sites. Um, FDA tr education training and inspectional tools, um, as well as harmonizing the tools that companies will have to measure their food safety culture. So I do know in the GFSI communities, the Global Food Safety Initiatives, um, BRC was one of the early adopters of the GFSI um, release of their expectations for food safety culture, which I believe was back in 2018. Uh, if, for those of you that are SQF certified, SQF here shortly, in the should be in the next month or so, will be releasing their edition nine uh, of their food manufacturing standard, which will include now requirements for measuring food safety culture. So GFSI communities have already been pushing towards that, um, uh, towards those components for a number of years here. And uh, FDA will continue to build upon that. So lastly here to end on this, um, how do I prepare, right, for these new era standards? Well, obviously knowledge is power. So make sure you're signing up for FDA alerts so you get the, the latest alerts and updates. Make sure you're staying connected in. I know CLFP does a great job um, trying to um, disseminate that information out to their constituents and their members as quickly as possible or when we become aware of them. Um, participate, right? So there's a number of the rules there, the laboratory rule, as well as the traceability rule that, that still are soliciting feedback um, from industry. So you do have a opportunity there to kind of direct some of the, the formation of the rule and those requirements and how it applies to your type of industry. Um, know where you stand, right? So this is where we, really where consultants or third parties can kind of come in and do gap assessments do evaluations of your FISMA standards and um, kind of give you that um, independent feedback in terms of how you stand and um, where you stand with FISMA compliance. I know this is an area where with our members of our trade association, we have modified our member audit program each year to now include FISMA elements for uh, those rules where compliance dates have come and gone to assess and then to give feedback to our members in terms of from an audit standpoint where they need to focus or where there may be gaps that need to be tightened before they do get those either announced or unannounced um, uh, FDA and state inspections. And then implement improved technology is appropriate. I think this is just going to be ever increasingly important. Um, obviously with this new era blueprint um, if you read the, at least the guidance that's been released in this blueprint, and I'm sure the rules that are pending to follow, there's going to be multiple references to technology and leveraging technology. So where you can leverage technology, I think your team should uh, start to think about that, especially when it comes to um, your HACCP and your food safety teams uh, surrounding the food safety uh, hazards in their um, significantly minimization or prevention of those hazards. And then obviously to go along with that knowledge building opportunities. So take advantage of those where you can. Um, I know our team has released and conducted a number of trainings that help support the regulatory compliance as well as your GFSI compliance um, in the areas of food safety culture, traceability, recall readiness, um, HACCP, um, and, and so forth. So with that being said, I want to just end here um, with a slide uh, talking about training. Uh, I know it's a shameless plug for our organization, but our organization and information on our training events, any um, help that any of you may need in terms of assessing where you're at with these requirements can be found at safefoodalliance.com. Um, this, this page is just a summary of our next eight upcoming um, Public courses, um, we're doing all these virtually for the time being. We hope to get back into the classroom type setting because I know a, a number of you enjoy that setting um, and your staff enjoy that setting in terms of getting away from the facility for a day or two and focusing on some of the subjects that we have to offer. 
But for now, we are doing these in this type of a format, virtual format, um, and we are doing them live. So they are instructor led. Um, so the next one actually we have done by our lab team is actually a free webinar. So for your staff that is involved in sampling products, testing products, um, sending product to the lab and meeting um, customer specification, this sampling for success may be uh, one here um, in the next week for you to check out. And then we do have sanitation fundamentals for sanitation staff, um, supervisorial staff on the sanitation level. And then we have started this um, HACCP um, uh, sessions, I guess you would call them our course, coursework. We do have uh, what we call HACCP 101 through 103, which would be ending up with advanced HACCP techniques in terms of really strengthening and um, you know, leveraging more of that knowledge for your food safety uh, in HACCP plans. And then some FISMA rule training. We talked about the training requirements for the FISMA intentional adulteration rule and some awareness there. Um, so actually that is going to be one we're going to be releasing here shortly on our website. We do have self-paced courses as well in some of these areas. So you may want to check those out or have staff that are you, you need um, to bring up to speed on these subjects, um, whether that be yourself or others um, that you work with. Um, uh, we do have those self-paced courses that you can take at your own leisure um, that are certificated courses as well. So with that being said, I know um, we took a little longer there. We had a short delay and some technical issues, but hopefully everything came through uh, loud and clear. I wanna thank you for your time. Um, at this point, um, I guess, open it up to any questions and spend some time there answering um, answering your questions. Um, so I will I will just manage this right now in terms of where I have visibility and um, for now I do know there is one um, question here in the Q&A session um, and I think the best way may be to to add to the chat feature there and I'll just kind of scroll through those but the first one is that if you are a processor of tomatoes performing a kill step, what required documents do you need for um, any of the contracted farmers you get your tomatoes from? Do we need to provide um, a statement in our contract that speaks to tomatoes being harvested as having a kill step? Um, so yes, so the, the answer is yes. I see a lot of these contracts, right, that those type of operations have, um, have with their growers, right, in terms of just basically being compliant with good uh, ag practices or gaps. Um, right now under the produce safety rule, right, there um, are stipulations where that farm needs to demonstrate and be aware of who they're selling to. Um, and basically that's where you may be giving some feedback or some information back to the farm on that level. There have been certain industries that have gone, um, like one comes to mind, uh, the almond industry, where they do have mandatory treatment requirements, where they have um, statements on bill of ladings or shipping documents. So the rule does give a some flexibility in terms of how you document that. It's not going to tell you how you need to document that specifically. Um, but ultimately, it'll be the farms that will be um, required as the rule is stated under that. But keep in mind, you know, in our state, our state produce safety program, they're aware of the commodities, right, that our state <clears throat> um, produces, right? And, and by and large, they're, they're not going to be sending those questionnaires out to most of those folks. They're going to be focused on more of those um, 22,000 farms. Um, you know, if it was producing fresh fresh market tomatoes, and that's a different story, right? But some of them may still be getting those questionnaires to, um, to fill out and send in, and that's where those statements can become handy. Um, okay, so I had another question here. Um, it wanted some, um, we wanted some clarity on food defense plan requirements only apply to human food, not animal food facilities. And um, yes, I believe that is the case um, for the time being. Um, like we said, um, you know, um, still some of the food defense, the basic elements would be applicable. And, and really, if you are a food, uh, a, a, a animal food facility, you, 
and you are doing a GFSI style audit, you know, there will be elements of that that span beyond the regulation um, as well. So um, on offering copies of the slide, that may be a question more for CLFP. I'm sure our website, Safe Food Alliance 2, will post a recording of this session as well. So you can access the slides. Um, I don't know, Trudy, if you're still on, if that's something you guys plan to do, or Olivia on the CLFP side? Yes. Yes, yes. we'll be providing the, the PowerPoint uh, to all the participants. Um, as well as the recording. So we'll have that on our website as well. Um, I'm not the technical person, but we will definitely make sure that folks are be able to access that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks, Trudy. And then another role, yeah, I was talking about the foreign supplier verification rules. So if you have been trained, what I was referring to is you have to have verification activities, right? If you're the importer, so reviewing food safety audits done for compliance and those audit reports for from your supplier, um, any type of records that are important for traceability uh, upon receipt. So if you are a trained PCQI, you have that certificate, that essentially would, would mean you're a qualified individual to do those types of verification activities. And keep in mind, you can further identify yourself as a qualified individual based on further training as well as experience, education on the job as well under the foreign supplier verification rule. So hopefully that helps clarify that. So preventive controls for human foods rule requires a mandatory training. The FSVP does not. However, you have to use qualified individuals to do the verification activities. So hopefully that helps clarify that further. Okay. Any other questions? Let me see here. I'll just monitor our two things going here. We have the Q&A and the chat feature, which is great. So thank you so far for your questions. Um, by all means, yes, feel free to reach out to, to us through our website. Um, one of the things I will do as well, I'll just type into the chat feature. I didn't put a slide with my particular contacts, but I will type in my um, direct email here so that if any of you want to reach out via email to me, you're more than welcome to. Um, so there is my email, jeremiahs at safefoodalliance.com. Um, so anytime, uh, I'm out and about. I do quite a bit of audits and training and consulting, so I'm not always readily available depending on which day it is. Um, but by all means, if you have questions that come up, um, uh, either I'll, I'll know the answer, and if I don't, uh, I'll search out and uh, be sure to track down the answer for you folks. Well, on behalf of the league, Jeremiah, thank you very, very much. The LFP always appreciates working uh, with Safe Food Alliance. Um, thank you for all the great information, and we'll look forward to hopefully doing some uh, future webinars. Thank you. Thank okay. you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everybody.